By now, the figure is up to about 300 cases, and I get that number from a retired federal agent who I communicate with very often. I'm talking about the cases of young college-age men who've been found dead in rivers, but they disappeared in unexplained ways. The colloquial term for these men is the smiley face killers, although it has to be said that retired detective Kevin Cannon and Professor Lee Gilbertson, who were the first to talk about these cases, separate themselves very much from the name the smiley face killers, because they feel it trivializes and lessens the impact. However, dozens, in fact hundreds, of young men have vanished without a trace, only to be found dead weeks or months later in remote rivers or creeks, shallow ponds or canals, in areas that search parties have searched multiple times before. Then later, their bodies are discovered there, as though they've been placed there deliberately to be found. I first started looking into these cases about six years ago, but I first heard of them when I listened to Coast to Coast AM. A journalist called Christy Peel was on, talking about these cases with the host Ian Punnett. She had been investigating the disappearance and subsequent death of a young man in the Midwest who'd been found in a pond, bobbing upright in the water, but he was dead. Well, that's not how you die. Well, it seems that around the same time, New York Police Detective Kevin Gannon was investigating the strange death of a student called Patrick McNeil. When he looked into this case, he soon found that there were up to 40 other young men who had also disappeared and been found dead in the water, just like that victim. Kevin Gannon, once he retired with his former partner, Duarte, went around the country searching for the evidence to prove that there were more than a few victims who all disappeared in the same way and were all found dead in the water. Sometimes they disappeared on the same night, but hundreds of miles away from each other. The name, the Smiley Face Killers, derives from the graffiti that the detectives said they found near the scene of where they found the bodies. The graffiti was always of smiley faces, but the signatures of them varied according to the geography of where they were found. For the victims, they go directly into the shallow water, and then they are all gone. No ghost, no memories, as if they never lived in the first place, and then they stay there, awake and afraid. That's a quote that comes from a site of mind and motives. One of the victim's mothers has said, The evil is rampant and deep and widespread. He was tortured, taken to the river and killed, then his body was positioned. At the same time, a missing person's poster had some writing on it, and it said, Loaded in cargo van, paid in dollars green. A cryptic message that I saw on a forum said, We take what we need and leave. Understand this. This is necessary. Life feeds on life feeds on death. One mother, whose son was perhaps one of the victims, said, This is what they did to my son. Someone killed my son. Before he died, he was pleading to someone who dropped him in the dark. He paid for you to learn the lesson. He had no idea he was going to die. There is something very sinister happening to college-age men. It's been going on since the early 90s, and probably since before then. It isn't stopping, it appears to be escalating. Young men attending college are going missing across the United States, and surprisingly, it could also tie into the UK. The numbers are rising as they disappear in what can only be described as the most sinister and inexplicable circumstances, and yet there are patterns. Then they're found dead, always in water, often very shallow water, but very often they haven't drowned. One mother says, I couldn't get through to him. He couldn't talk. He couldn't tell me where he was. Eight minutes into the call, there was suddenly this ghastly screaming. I started crying. Well, let's start at the beginning. Many don't buy into the belief that there's something strange going on. They say young men and drinking doesn't go together very well, and that accidents are inevitable. Of course, this is a possibility, and probably does happen in some of these cases. But when taking a look at some of the cases individually, invariably there is an element of high strangeness about how and why they ended up in the water. When looking at them as a whole, there's a very clear set of commonalities and patterns which link them together, and these commonalities are terrifying. How does a young man end up dead in the water, water that's only a couple of feet deep? Why can't he get out of that water, even though he's not drunk? Why can't he be found in that water? often for weeks, when it's searched multiple times. Why would he go to the most remote body of water, in the opposite direction to the one in which he was heading? 
Why did his cell phone suddenly go dead after he said something disturbing? Why do many of them make desperate phone calls just moments before something happens to them? Why are some in such a state of terror or horror when they phone their parents or friends? Why does it always happen on a night out? How do they disappear from bars yet no one sees them go? What are they seeing in the final moments before their phone is cut off? Why do few of them have any signs of injury or trauma on their body? For anyone thinking there is not something very odd going on, for anyone thinking this is just an urban legend, perhaps this set of circumstances is a good example for contemplation. One mother says, We almost lost Cullen on Sunday. It all started the night before. He and his friend Ryan had gone off to La Crosse to the bars with their friend Jay. My son drove, and they all planned to stay the night at Jay's. At 1.30am, they were at John's bar. At bar time, Cullen was nowhere to be found. Ryan and Jay were trying to find him until 5.30 in the morning. Cullen resurfaced at 7am, in the emergency room of the hospital. He remembers being in the bar. The next thing he remembers is being in the river. He fought his way out of the river and collapsed on the shore. He had no jacket or shoes. He ran to the sound of the cars nearby, saw a sign for the hospital, and ran to the emergency room in just his socks. He voluntarily gave urine and blood samples. I'm thinking he must have had way too much to drink. His results came back. He was not drunk. And yet, he can't remember anything from 1.30 in the morning until he woke up in the river. What did someone put in his drink? I don't think he realises he almost died. I don't think he realises someone almost killed him. He somehow managed to get out of the water. I think that he was not drunk is a factor. Well, strangely, he's not the only boy in that area of La Crosse, Wisconsin, to have been in a desperate fight for his life. In the next case, however, it ended in tragedy and untold suffering. Jeff Giese was found drowned in the same river in 1999. The case was investigated by retired detectives Kemi Gannon and Anthony Duarte, along with Professor Gilbertson of St. Cloud University, a specialist in gang-stalking and domestic terrorism. This young man, too, had disappeared during a night out in a bar. He vanished on April the 10th. His body was recovered on May the 24th in the river. A bloodhound privately brought in by this team tracked the boy's scent to the Nabowski Ridge, Wisconsin, where it then performed a trauma roll, which was indicative of a physical altercation. It indicated that the boy had undergone a physical altercation of some type. The dog's behaviour then indicated that the boy had been placed into a vehicle and transported from the spot to which his body was recovered. He was found in a shallow gravel pit, drowned. He was missing one shoe, which is strangely often the case. The dog tracked away from the shallow pit, however, indicating that someone who had been in contact physically with the boy had walked away from the area after leaving his body. Chillingly, Gannon and Gilbertson point out that this dog also picked up on another boy's scent, who had also gone missing, and it was the boy, Cullen, whose mother, in the previous account, had written of her son's lucky escape after inexplicably finding himself in the river. Her son was the lucky one because for Jeff Giese his fate was horrific. His body displayed signs that he had been held somewhere for an extended period of time, hanging upside down. His body had been drained of blood. In another case, a victim had been restrained by the neck, and his face and body burnt. Others have no sign of injury, and yet no water in their lungs. How could they have drowned? Others have simply never been seen again. When I spoke to Professor Gilbertson first, several years ago, he pointed out to me that he was concerned that the deaths appeared to have spread to the UK. I'd also spoken with a former federal agent, whose name I'm withholding at the moment. They too had been following the cases from the beginning, and are still investigating them now. The agent said, look at all the names here, and we think we've only scratched the surface. That's what really scares me. I'd also spoken with several family members of the victims, who were of the opinion that these were not simple accidents or misadventure. 
When I spoke to Professor Gilbertson again, this time in February 2016, he said they'd spread to Ireland. How could this possibly be? Mr. Ian shrouds so many of these cases, and on a side note, when I was first looking into the deaths, I was contacted by a person who had a blog dedicated to charting and investigating them. At their own request, they asked for anonymity and warned me that they themselves had come under attack while looking into the deaths, so much so that they had been forced to stop. They now wanted nothing more to do with it. They were contacting me to give me a warning. This could happen to me. At the time, I thought they were crazy. In hindsight, I should have listened to them. Award-winning Christy Peel appeared on Coast to Coast AM years ago in an attempt to bring light to these mysterious disappearances and deaths. It was not long afterward that she too closed down her blog, which was dedicated to investigating the cases, and refused to have any more to do with it. One has to ask, then, why do people who get involved in this invariably end up distancing themselves from it? Of course, those who say it is just drunk men falling into water, who have not looked at the circumstances in which they are found, nor the autopsy or police reports, will say it is because they realised it was all something and nothing. That it was drunken accidents. But there are warning signs that keep flagging up for those who attempt to look into it. And this alone caused me to wonder why that would be. On the other hand, with a continuation of footsteps at the River's Edge blog and Vance Holmes's blog Drowning in Coincidence, in which he tracked the cases from the very beginning, it's clear that others have not stopped looking into it. Well, as I said, I began my research into these cases six or seven years ago and then published the book three or four years ago. When Christy Peel first appeared on Coast to Coast Radio back in 2008, she was joined by forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Sikorica to discuss the tragic case of one of the victims, Todd Geib. On the 12th of June 2005, in Casanova, Michigan, 22-year-old Todd was last seen at a bonfire party. It was a marshy rural area. He left the party to walk back alone to his cousin's house, where he lived. He never made it back there. He called a friend at 12.51am, but all he said was, I'm in a field, before the phone call cut off. When the friend rang back, all the friend could hear was what sounded like the wind. The area where he was last seen was thoroughly searched three times. During one of the searches, as many as 1,500 volunteers searched the area. He was not found. When his body was discovered there, weeks later, in a remote bed of water, his death was ruled as undetermined. When a new autopsy was carried out, he was discovered to have been dead only two to five days, despite being missing for three weeks. In other words, he had been kept alive somewhere for approximately two and a half weeks prior to his death. Where he was found had been thoroughly searched at least three times. When independent pathologist Dr. Sikorica was allowed access to the autopsy files, he concluded through forensic analysis that Todd had been dead only between two to five days, and most crucially, his body was not in the condition it would be expected to be in, and he had no water in his lungs, so he could not have drowned. He had not been in the water for the twenty or so days he'd been missing. He'd been held or kept alive somewhere for approximately three weeks before being taken to the creek and placed in it. He'd been placed into the water to make it look like he had drowned. Where had he been before this was done to him? What was done to him when he was held somewhere by someone? According to the couple who found Todd, he was standing upright in Obernall Lake. It was reported they remember it distinctly because his head and shoulders were sticking out of the water. This is not how a person drowns, and this is not the sort of position a person will die in. It is as though he'd been put in that position deliberately, like a raised flag, like someone leaving a message, like someone taunting those who would eventually have to retrieve his body. Said Christy Peel at the time, these drowning mysteries defy logic. Dr. Sikorica's opinion that Todd did not die in the pond, but was later placed into the pond, 
was backed up by two hundred other forensic examiners when he presented the strange case at an international convention of medical examiners. There was no mistaking that this was not normal. Prissy Peel said of the cases that she investigated, A lot of people have asked me who is doing this. Whoever had Todd is a sick individual. I think we're going to find a dark human being of a kind we haven't met yet. But the odds are it's more than one person. As the case is turned into a heavy pile of files, it will become very clear that this is not the work of one killer, nor of one group. It all began when journalist Christy Peel joined forces with the two retired NYPD detectives Gannon and Duarte over twenty years ago. Gannon had investigated what he believed was the first case, and it was these two ex-detectives who first discovered what became known as the Smiley Face Killers. And as they say, it's now a label that they don't really want to be used, because it trivialises and sensationalises the cases. But what these two detectives discovered, however, was sensational, and it was sickening. Forty more cases could fall under the umbrella of the Smiley Face Killers. Forty more boys had died at their hands. The phrase, the smiley face killers, was derived from the claim by Gannon that graffiti was found at or near the bodies, smiley faces, sometimes with devil horns. The first case they looked into occurred when Detective Gannon was still a serving officer with NYPD. He gained bravery citations and, after retiring, remortgaged his house to finance a deeper investigation into these cases himself. Patrick McNeil was 21 when he walked out of a bar in New York City on a cold night in February 1997. He told his friends he was taking the subway back to Fordham University, where he was studying, but he never made it back there. His body was found in the water at Owl's Head Water Pollution Plant, near a Brooklyn pier, almost two months later. His body was found face up, which is not the usual position for a person who drowns. The pathologist stated he was not drunk when he died of drowning, but some very concerning questions arose. According to Detective Gannon, as the young man exited the bar he'd been drinking in, the Dapper Dog, in Uptown Manhattan, he appeared very drunk, so much so that he was bending over in the street as though he needed to vomit. He seemed very uncoordinated. He attempted to walk off down the street, stumbling along, and as he did so, a double-parked car began to move beside him. Patrick stopped again, as though he was about to be sick, stumbled and fell over. The car beside him stopped. When Patrick managed to recover and pick himself back up, the car began to follow him again. He was found, more than forty days later, dead in the river. He was face up and partially clothed. Interestingly, a couple was said to have been in the car following Patrick before he disappeared. Of course, couples are far less likely to arouse suspicion, and yet why would a woman be involved in this kind of thing? I know that in one of my other books I described the case of a UK double murder of two young girls who were abducted and killed, and I looked at the alternative theories floating around about who the real perpetrators were. There was the suggestion then that the perpetrator serving life was not really the one who did it. There were witness accounts of a man and a woman intensely watching the children from afar as they sat in a car. In some of the 90 or so Manchester UK drowning cases, as I'll talk about later, a woman was actually convicted as being part of a gang who drowned a man deliberately. So women, it seems, may perhaps play a role in these horrific drowning cases then. At Patrick McNeil's inquest, the pathologist stated he was not drunk, but he did die of drowning. He noted a possible ligature mark around the man's neck, but this was not followed up by the police. Another renowned independent forensic pathologist, Dr. Sewell Wecht, when reviewing the case for journalist Christy Peel, stated, There's no way this man is accidentally going to fall into a body of water, and the fly, larvae that was found to have been laid in the groin area, well, it's an indoor fly, not an outdoor fly. So we have a body that was already dead, before it was placed in the water. So I would call it homicide, yes. 
In other words, the young man had been kept alive for an extended period of time again, prior to being found in the water, long enough for indoor larvae to settle on his body. He had been kept alive somewhere, indoors. Then, he had been taken to the river and placed in it. The city medical examiner had ruled Patrick's death as drowning. Kevin Gannon, however, has said he was stalked, abducted, held for an extended period of time, murdered and disposed of. They're psychopaths. They have no remorse. Gannon's team believed that the black decomposition noted in the city examiner's report was in actuality charring. Gannon believed that McNeil had been burnt from the head down to mid-torso with something like a blowtorch. Another retired federal agent I liaise with, however, believes that this could actually have been caused by his body being placed in a freezer. But either way, it's highly disturbing. From the possible ligature mark, Gannon's team suggested McNeil could have been bound in a chair tied by the neck, restrained and tortured, as his back appeared to have no charring on it, only his front. His face was the most burnt part of his body. Clearly, his torment and suffering before being found in the river was absolutely horrific, if this is the case. When I spoke with Kevin Gannon's supervisor at NYPD about these cases, he suggested I look into the disappearance of a boy called Larry Andrews. A few months before Patrick McNeil's disappearance, Larry Andrews had come into New York City by train with a large group of friends from their hometown in Westchester County. It was New Year's Eve and they were excited to be joining the celebrations in the big city. However, Larry never made it to Times Square. The group arrived at Grand Central Station and went to a bar called Hoolihan's close by. Then they began a bar hop. At some point during this, one moment Larry was suddenly gone. He was last known to have been on 42nd Street. Then he simply vanished. Six weeks later, on the 12th of February 1997, he was found. His body was floating in the Bay Ridge River off Owl's Head Park. His body was not far from where Patrick McNeil's body would later be found. Larry was still wearing the winter clothing he'd set out in. His wallet, with money, was still inside. He disappeared off the face of the earth, his father said. Police said he went into the Hudson River and that the tide carried him to Brooklyn. He disappeared after they left the bar. There was no reason for him to walk to the water all the way on the west side. His father hired a private investigator called Gil Alba, a former police detective. Despite weeks of investigation, he could not determine what happened to the young man. He said, I talked to people in bars all along the route from river to river, but he found no leads to follow. He looked into the boy's private life, checked for any problems, debts or cult or gang involvement, but he found nothing. He said, I know this kid inside out now, and there's nothing. I couldn't find anything. Larry was found in the water off Owl's Head Park. Patrick McNeil was found close by at Owl's Head Water Pollution Plant. Josh Jossack's parents found a severed owl's head on their doorstep. Josh Jossack's father has never stopped gathering evidence about the death of his son. His son's death was ruled as accidental drowning, but his son was last seen alive outside of a bar, like Patrick, like Larry and the circumstances of his disappearance were to go on to be replayed in chillingly similar scenarios for the next two decades, and is continuing now, as young men continue to disappear on a night out, only to later be found dead in a body of water. Josh Stoshak had been spending the evening of December the 22nd, 2007, celebrating a friend's birthday in a bar called the Bayo Café. Later, his friends said there was nothing about Josh's behaviour that night which caused them any concern. Nothing stood out or alerted them to what was to come. While Josh was inside the bar on North Pearl Street in downtown Albany, New York, his evening was captured on security surveillance footage. He was enjoying his night drinking beer, listening to music and having fun. It's thought he'd had three beers. Not an exceptional number, particularly for a young man his size, 
He was over six foot and not a lightweight. He was a fit young man and enrolled as a student at the local college. That night, he certainly didn't appear to be falling down drunk or stumbling around. Everything was normal for a while. None of Josh's friends can explain what happened shortly after midnight or why Josh and a friend went outside. The most logical explanation is that they wanted some fresh air. The bar inside was packed with young people. A street camera located adjacent to the bar captured him as he exited the bar with his friend. It's not clear footage, the quality of it is quite grainy, and of course it's old now. Josh and his friend stand outside directly in front of the bar for a couple of minutes talking, and then his friend leaves, presumably going home. His other friends are still inside the bar. The footage shows that Josh then suddenly appears to become very hot. It looks like he takes off not only his jacket but a jumper too. Some who have watched it also think he fumbles for and pulls out his cell phone. It would suggest that his phone was perhaps ringing or vibrating or that he was going to call someone to summon help. Outside the bar it's busy with other people, some standing smoking or talking, others passing by, and there's a range of people from young men to old and some young women. No doubt many have tried to analyse what all of these people are doing as they stand outside close to Josh. Perhaps they had something to do with what later happened to him. It's very hard to determine, but perhaps someone will be able to find that elusive clue amid these people, which will show that one or more of them were in some way involved in what happened to him. Certainly, if a person does not willingly walk into the water, then someone, and probably more than one, is perhaps playing a role to either lure or take that person to the water, or to hold them first somewhere else, for purposes and motive we would not wish to contemplate, because it is so dark, but contemplate it we must. Between the place of their disappearance and the place of water they are later found in, there will often be an extended period of time in which their actual location remains unknown, a hidden place of dark intention, and as yet a secret place where no one would ever want to venture. A place of unspeakable torment, where the mind is tortured more so than the body. The mind is a delicate thing, and consciousness even more so. It is there that it's fractured and broken. The torment, of course, permeates more than just the victim. It's the family of the victim, too. The parents who are victims themselves to an unendurable lifetime of pain that no one could imagine the depths of. Josh, then, appears to be suddenly very hot on a cold night in December. But it isn't just that. He can be seen stumbling and suddenly uncoordinated. He looks like he is struggling to sort out his jumper and jacket. At one point he attempts to put his jacket back on, and it looks as though he is about to put it on back to front, until he straightens it out and manages to get it on. He's glancing around at people and back toward the bar entrance, but he doesn't appear to be worried or necessarily anxious or scared at all. He just looks really out of it. As the CCTV images continue, he walks from the left side of the screen, across in front of the bar, past the entrance door, and comes to a halt on the right-hand side of the screen. Of course, he had been drinking, and as his father later said, he enjoyed Guinness. But Guinness is very different to shots of tequila or cocktails. In other words, like most young men, he enjoyed beer or ale, but he hadn't been knocking back shots of strong spirit that night. And yet he is hot, uncoordinated and stumbling. He's very disoriented. He looks drunk, very drunk, or rather, that would be the natural assumption when watching his body's reactions. However, there is another much more sinister reason why he could be in the state he's in. It's very possible he has been drugged. In fact, the retired federal agent who has followed these cases for over a decade, and who I liaise with very often, has told me that he has evidence on security footage inside the bar of Josh being injected with something. Outside the bar, after getting his jacket back on, he now seems to gather himself together and begins to walk off. He exits from the screen on the right-hand side and disappears from view. The assumption has to be, then, that he's already said goodnight to his friends inside the bar, or, in his confused state, he thought he had, and was now heading back to his car, where he'd left it a couple of blocks away. Of course, he was in no state to drive, but his mind wasn't working properly any more. Later, it would become apparent that he had not said goodnight to his friends at all. They had no idea that he'd left. He's seen one more time very briefly, just over a minute away on a camera that was located on the street close to the bar. Where he went after that is not known. 
His car was parked a couple of blocks away from the bar, but inexplicably, he was not seen on any more surveillance cameras. He should have been, if he continued walking, because there were other cameras on the sidewalks along the route, but it was as though he simply vanished. Of course, no one knew he'd gone missing just yet. Strangely, around the same time that Josh simply disappeared from the street, on the outskirts of the city close to the Albany port, a different surveillance camera was picking something else up. This camera was situated at a government facility, the Department of Environmental Conservation. A figure was captured on camera in the parking lot of the building, stealing an SUV that belonged to the department. The unknown person breaks into the car, starts it up and drives away, getting captured on two more surveillance cameras as the stolen car leaves the facility and drives off, ending up at a spot by the water not too far away, but one that is more deserted. The area the car was entering, though deserted, had a locked gate. The driver drove the car straight through the locked gate. Conveniently for the driver, this area had no surveillance cameras. It was later discovered through the subsequent police investigation that the driver then abandoned the stolen vehicle, yet apparently left neither forensic evidence nor any clues as to why they'd taken it. Why would someone steal a car and then abandon it just minutes later nearby? Had they simply walked away from that remote riverside location? Or, given that there were no cameras at the exact location where the SUV was abandoned, had the driver gone for a detour somewhere else? before they abandoned it? Had they made a quick detour into the city? Did another vehicle arrive at the scene to pick that person up? The driver couldn't be identified due to there being no surveillance at the dark spot, or if they had been identified, certainly the police never revealed this. Although the actions at the desolate spot couldn't be determined, there's the obvious implication that the car thief may have been fully aware that it was an ideal spot to choose to conduct an activity they did not want to be observed on camera. What could that activity be? A drug deal? Selling illegal guns, perhaps? Or a transaction of an even darker nature? The selling of a human being? Or at least, arranging the transportation of one? Had another vehicle joined the SUV there? Had a package been handed over? A package being a human, still alive, snatched off the street just moments earlier? If so... This would clearly show an obvious planning stage beforehand. Police reports indicate that they became aware of the car theft and responded to the incident, arriving at the scene at approximately 1.40am, which was well after Josh's last sighting. Josh was seen at just after midnight. The stolen car was examined and taken away. It had damage to the front of it from the impact from the lock gate. Also, rather oddly, Josh's cell phone would later be found around the front of the Environmental Conservation Department building where the vehicle had been stolen from. There was no prints on the car, and DNA evidence was inconclusive. The department building itself had not been burglarised, and there were no signs of forced entry into the building, so it did not appear that the car theft related to anyone trying to get into the building to steal anything from it. But why was Josh's phone found there later? How could he have got to the building when he'd last been seen outside the bar, nowhere near the building, and he was in no state to have got there? He was also a student with no criminal record. The next day, when it was determined that Josh had gone missing, his car was found still parked in the same spot he'd left it in before going to the bar. He clearly hadn't driven to the environmental building, and he had no reason to take a taxi there. He had also not looked capable of doing anything when last seen on the surveillance footage outside the bar. At that time, it wasn't known that he'd disappeared. His parents had no idea that he'd seemingly vanished off the street somewhere between the last surveillance camera recording him and where he'd left his car. In fact, the area could be narrowed down further than that because there were other several cameras dotted along the two-block walk back to his car, but he was only captured on one of them just a minute after walking away from the bar. It would become clear then that between the last sighting and the next camera, something had happened to him that had caused him to disappear from sight. The most realistic suggestion as to what happened to him could only be that either he somehow entered a building in that small grid area, or he entered a vehicle. 
He couldn't have been walking around anymore at that point, because he would have been seen on footage. When Josh's phone was found by the building, the police believed he had to be the same person who'd stolen the SUV and then broken down the gate to get into the isolated riverside location where it was abandoned. In fact, when Josh's parents reported their son missing the next day, the police told them he'd stolen the car and was now the suspect in a robbery. However, forensic analysis failed to find any fingerprint evidence of Josh having taken the car, and he was subsequently ruled out as the perpetrator of the crime. Then, he became officially a missing person. His father, an experienced arson investigator, was scathing of the police effort to find his missing son. His father drove out to the site of the government building and the site where the car had been abandoned. He came across freshly painted smiley graffiti. He'd heard of the two retired NYPD detectives, Gannon and Duarte, from their media appearances, and he contacted them straight away. They'd been telling anyone who would listen that young men were being abducted, held for an indeterminate length of time, tortured, killed and disposed of in the rivers. They said that the smiley-faced graffiti was often found at or near the scene. They'd hired private pathologists to re-examine cases. They were convinced that a group was doing this. The police themselves, however, were not convinced of the relevance or authenticity of the graffiti discovery, and in fact, they would later suggest that the young man's father, the arson investigator, had sprayed it there himself. His father, understandably, would have been furious about that. He was also upset by what appeared to have been done to his son's retrieved cell phone. It seemed that while his father said he had received police photographs of the cell phone, clearly showing several unread text messages, when he then asked the police about the messages, they appeared to have been deleted, and this too was a major disappointment to him. He'd wondered if there could have been vital information in those texts, which could have perhaps explained what happened to his son. The report from the Albany Police Department said the investigator found no text messages on his phone. His father, however, says that Bethlehem's report contradicts this. The photograph of the cell phone said that it had eight new messages. Somebody had to erase those messages. In an eerily and chilling replication of the disappearance of Patrick McNeil, according to Cardinal Points Online, Josh's father said a vehicle was seen on camera several times driving past the bar my son was in prior to his disappearance. Cameras then spotted the car later at two locations, after a vehicle was stolen from the Department of Conservation on the port. After this vehicle left the parking lot there, it drove to the most southern part of the port. This part of the port is the only area not covered by cameras. Two cameras spotted it during this time, and the vehicle was seen driving past the bar. The vehicle that was following was abandoned by the driver. Though the police were now investigating their son's disappearance as a missing person, the parents felt that because they had initially treated him as a suspect, the police had lost vital time in searching for him as a missing person, when the first few hours after someone disappears are vital. The police department spoke out by saying that they had employed helicopters, canines and sonar search units as soon as they realised what had happened. Sadly, however, despite this search effort ongoing over several days, no trace of Josh other than his cell phone could be found. If he had been seen walking from the bar, a distance of two miles from the government building where the car was stolen, and bearing in mind that at the time he'd been stumbling and very disoriented, he was not seen on any more CCTV cameras. So is there any possible way he could have got to that building himself and then managed to break into the government-owned car and drive it away? It would seem entirely impossible. And then, of course, we know, according to his father, that this stolen vehicle was seen outside of the bar that he disappeared from. The search for Josh continued for weeks, but there was no sign of him and no leads to follow. It was to be four long months until he was found, on April 22nd, 2008, dead in the Hudson River, in the Coxsackie area, about 20 miles away. The police determined very quickly that he was the victim of an accidental drowning, and that there appeared to be no signs of foul play. Police Captain Wayne Olsen said his body showed no signs of a struggle. He was wearing the same casual clothes he'd disappeared in, and his wallet and ID were still on him. 
His father, of course, was not at all satisfied with this ruling of an accidental drowning. He wanted another autopsy done, and so he employed the services of an internationally renowned forensic pathologist called Dr. Baden, who proceeded to carry it out. His findings, however, fully corroborated the autopsy results of the first county coroner. In other words, he too found it to be a tragic case of accidental drowning, consistent with those of the first autopsy. Like the first autopsy, Dr. Baden found no evidence of any injury or any sign of a struggle or violence. Although, of course, we can say that surely it's suspicious that there's no sign of a struggle. Because when a person drowns, even if they are drunk, the survival instinct kicks in and they automatically fight for air. And that can be seen in the autopsies. Dr. Baden did add, however, that the investigation as to whether he fell in or whether he was pushed in or thrown in by others is a police investigation matter. He said the autopsy findings would be the same in either case. In other words, the pathologist could find no signs of suspicious activity because he was only looking at the body, not at the circumstances surrounding how Josh came to be in the river. And his implication by making that statement is that the matter of how he ended up in the river would be for the police to investigate. He is saying that the cause of death does not explain how or why he ended up dying. The ruling of accidental death also didn't explain why. On the one-year anniversary of Josh's death, when his parents returned from visiting his grave, they found a message on their answer phone. When they listened to it, it was their son crying for his mum. This was told to me by the ex-federal agent, who has collected case files on this murder, and who has worked closely with the victim's father. And they're determined to end this. The message had been pre-recorded, of course, because their son was now dead. Someone, perhaps more than one, had made that recording while the son was still alive, which would obviously mean that he did not walk away from that bar and fall into the river on his own, that he was still alive when that recording was made, and that he had to have been held somewhere against his will in the most horrifying circumstances. His killers took pleasure in making that recording. His killers enjoyed sending that recording to his parents. The police, for their part, were firm in the opinion that it was simply a tragic accident. Spokesman for the police department at Albany at the time, Detective James Miller, said that from interviews with independent witnesses, the possibility that the smiley-faced graffiti was drawn by anyone connected with Josh Jossack's death had been ruled out. The graffiti had been found at the scene of the car theft. Coincidentally, the same place that Josh's phone was also found. It was Josh's father who found it, and he was fully aware of the significance, having followed other cases that had come to light in the media that had the similar graffiti. But Detective Miller said, we don't believe it's related at all. Then he appears to contradict himself by saying, more than likely it's just a cruel hoax on someone's part. Cruel, yes, but probably not a hoax. How likely is it that someone, at this early stage of the smiley-faced killer's spree, would perpetrate a hoax? At this point in time, the phenomenon was not even that well known, really, to have encouraged a copycat to have spray-painted it. But even more, how would they have known to paint a smiley face for the father to find, unless they themselves knew that Josh's phone would be found at the scene? With a retired federal agent, whose name I keep withholding, has worked relentlessly with Josh's father ever since the death of his son. And he told me that they traced the telephone call made to his parents on the one-year anniversary of their son's death, in which he is crying, to a trucking company in the Heartlands. Who was behind it? Well, they're keeping that to themselves for now, but there is a very strong possibility that his killers will be hunted down. Larry Andrews was found off Owl's Head. Patrick McNeil was found at Owl's Head water pollution plant close to Larry. Josh's parents were sent to severed Owl's Head after their son was found dead. It was left on their doorstep. The owl is a nocturnal bird of prey. Owls are a predatory bird and have an ability to see in the dark. They can see what we cannot see. They are silent watchers and wait quietly in the night to strike. They are silent in flight, stealth-like. In the Egyptian system of hieroglyphics, the owl symbolizes cold, night, and passivity, and the realm of the dead sun which has set 
and is crossing the lake or sea of darkness.